So welcome to the third and final academic lecture series for the fall semester. Of course, we are looking forward to a vibrant schedule in the spring semester, which I'll be putting out a call for with Rosaria's help to remind me uh, very shortly. Uh, but let's focus on today and the important and interesting lecture we have. Um, the academic lecture series is brought to you by the Lash Center for Teaching and Learning. I'm Brian McGuire. I'm an associate professor of English and the Teaching and Learning Fellow through the Lash Center. So welcome and thank you very much for attending today. I'm just going to do a brief introduction for Dr. Carlos Almeida, who's an associate professor of Portuguese and the director of Luso Centro at Bristol Community College. He is also the visiting lecturer in the Department of Portuguese at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. He received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, a Master's of Arts in Hispanic Literatures and Linguistics, and a Doctorate in Lusophone Literatures and Cultures from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He specializes in Portuguese and Cabo Verdean languages, literatures, and cultures. And today he's going to speak to us about a translation, Chiquino. Right? Chiquino. Yeah. Almost. Work harder, you know, I can get there. So, so without further ado, I'd like you to welcome with me Dr. Carlos Almeida. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that warm introduction. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Boa tarde. As we gather here to talk about crossing the Atlantic with Chiquinho, maintaining African identity in the diaspora, I would like to first thank Brian McGuire and the Bristol Academic Series Committee for inviting me to come talk about the English translation of this classic Cape Cabo Verdean novel. It's over here, as you can see. Okay. Uh, this event would have not been possible without the support and sponsorship of Center for Portuguese Studies and culture at the U.S. Dartmouth and Tagus Press uh, that published this translation. Okay. Before I start, however, I would like to acknowledge uh, my co uh, colleague and co-translator, uh, Isabel Rodrigues, who contributed to this presentation. Unfortunately, uh, she, was, she is in Ecuador on sabbatical, so she couldn't be here. <laughs> 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 Uh, of course, many more individuals uh, contribute to this translation, but due to the time restriction, it is impossible to mention them all. Them all. Among the readers of early versions, we are especially grateful to Professor Francisco Cotta Fagunch, by the way, my uh, doctor uh, dissertation advisor at UMass Amherst. Uh, for his careful reading of a very early draft of this generous and his generous ed editorial feedback and suggestions. Professors Alma Gottlieb and Philip Graham also read early drafts. In particular, Philip Graham offered essential literary and stylistic advice to make this translation stand as a literary piece in English. To our Tagus Press editor, Mario Pereira, we will remain grateful for his continued support, uh, editorial corrections and advice, and for making this publication possible. Finally, a special mention to Anna Klobuska, who translated this work with us, revised drafts, and altogether made this novel stand as a literary piece in English. Without her diligence and expertise, this translation would have not been possible. A thank you is also in order for Bristol Marketing and Communication Department, Television Service, all here present, and the Portuguese media for their support in promoting this event. Lastly, a special thank you to all of you who made the effort to be here with us. And now, 
uh, answering exactly on my presentation. Chiquinho uh, by Baltazar Lopes is the quintessential Cabo Verdean migration text, considered a founding novel of a truly distinct Cabo Verdean literature, one that consciously turned to its own people and region to write them out of colonial oblivion. Written throughout the 1930s, when the author was only in his 20s and against a context of rising fascism and censorship, Balthazar Lopes describes in Chiquinho the immiserating cycle of hunger and drought that desolated his homeland. In a state of colonial neglect and without appropriate food relief, Lopes documents the paradoxical agony of having to depart from one's homeland in order to be able to properly care for those who stayed behind. The novel is divided in three parts, childhood, São Vicente, and the rains. Narrated from the perspective of a boy, the main character, Chiquinho, who nostalgically writes about his childhood in the rural area island of San Nicolau. San Nicolau is the island that shapes his personality by listening to the endless storytelling of Mama Invelia and the talented Nia Rosa Calita, humorously called Camões. In the second part, São Vicente, Chiquinho comes of age, intellectually and emotionally. There, civilization paraded on the streets animated by the urban port life that was quite different from rural São Nicolau. The last part, the rains, narrates the return of Chiquinho to São Nicolau Island after completing the high school in São Vicente, a return that precipitated a confrontation with the impossibility of fulfilling, fulfilling one's dreams and expectations uh, in Cabo Verde, particularly in the island that formed what he called his Creole soul. This difficult return to the sleepy old town of Ribeira Brava, where he was no longer the kid but a stranger in his homeland marks a shift in his awakening to the possibility of migration to join his father in New Bedford. Inspired by the tales of sailors and whalers, Chiquinho dreams about his own maritime journey aboard the schooners where the souls of Cabo Verdean captains dwelled atop the masts, guiding passengers and sailors across the Atlantic. Migration was the main survival mechanism, particularly to the United States. As such, Chiquinho is simultaneously a novel of Cabo Verde and of its American diaspora. The two were emotionally and economically entwined. America was the fiction that allowed those who stayed behind to dream of a better life beyond the horizon of Vermeleria Cape. Conversely, for, her, for the immigrants in the United States, maimed by regimentation of factory work, Cabo Verde was the mirage that allowed one to fictionalize a return to a better place, free from the factory clock. As Chiquinho narrates, America was present everywhere. In the much anticipated immigrant letters that he read aloud in the presence of family and friends, carrying dollars and greetings for all, it was also present in the comfortable furniture and spring beds, in the sound of gramophones, and even inside one's home, where portraits of American presidents 
and wailing scenes from the New England adorn the walls side by side with family photographs and memorabilia. Furthermore, we learn from characters such as the wise Mr. Euclid's veranda and Jose Lima that one had to live in order to truly discover Cabo Verde. For instance, when Chiquinho contemplated his own migration to America, his old friend, Mr. Euclid's veranda, advised him not to hesitate and to take off, for he too regretted having stayed behind. Mr. Euclid confided, quote, only the ocean can free us. We are dots scattered at random in the middle of the Atlantic. The islands are, are our ports of departure. Where to, old man? asked Chiquinho. To Cabo Verde. But we are in Cabo Verde. Not really. The islands do live in the soul of each of us. End of quote. That soul has the, to be sustained further away to find its way back home. Similarly, his friend Jose Lima, who had returned from the USA where he gained a dry cough from working in a textile factory, advised Chiquinho to depart to that land where he could work hard at a cotton mill and study at any university he wanted. His American experience extraordinarily enriched his horizon. On Second Street, on Akushnet Avenue, and on Water Street, he found Cabo Verde. The pestle for pounding the corn for cachupa, the Uril game bench, the humming of songs with viola and guitar, just like in the islands. He reported they all spoke Cabo Verdean Creole, mixed with American words and phrases. Like so many Cabo Verdean families, Chiquinho's father and family history was intrinsically tied to the United States, particularly New Bedford. His own grandfather was a whaler who shipwrecked on his way back to Sonny Clow, leaving Mama Invelia behind to enjoy the home he had paid for with hard-earned money made at sea. The family gained the distinction of being considered well off in Calejão. São Nicolau, where he f the food, uh, food was always carefully stored away for times of need. Chiquinho's father lived on 102 South 2nd Street in downtown New Bedford. And the dollars he regularly sent to Calejão supported the family, the workers, the purchasing of gardens and domestic animals supporting also the most valued, valued investment, the, the education of one's children. Ultimately, Chiquinho comes to America aboard the schooner Atalanta. One of the previous uh, pictures shows the boat Atalanta. Owned by Cabo Verdean from Brava, Cabo Verdeans from Brava Island to join his father on 102 South 2nd Street, New Bedford. The journey of Chiquinho ties with so many migratory Cabo Verdean American experience since the whaling industry to the present day. So this is the 102 South 2nd Street a uh, hundred years after. Right, this is last year I took this picture, but imagine a hundred years where the story took place that Chiquinho and his father lived on this address. 
In the contemporary di diaspora, Cabo Verdeans American often hear about this classic novel of the uh, elder's homeland. This long-awaited translation uh, now brings the book's content to a diasporic readership whose native language is English. Uh, in this paper, I discuss what the new translation means to diasporic Cabo Verdeans for maintaining their identity in the US. Data comes from book launches, lo lo launch events. Uh, so far, we have done four events, uh, one in the uh, New Bedford Whaling Museum, uh, UMass Dartmouth, the, consult, uh, the Consulate of Cabo Verde in Boston, and the Embassy of Cabo Verde in Washington, who attended um, over the past eight months by hundreds, hundreds of excited Cabo Verdean Americans and responses to a survey by readers and audience participation at these events. In thinking about the readers and audiences' uh, reactions to the translation of Chiquinho, I was reminded uh, of the reader response criticism of the 1960s and 70s, particularly in the US and Germany, in the works by Norman Holland, Stanley Fish, Wolfgang Eiser, Holland Bach, among others, in which I quote, reader's response theory recognized the reader or audience as an active agent who imparts real existence to the work and completes its meaning through interpretation. Reader's response criticism argues that literature should be viewed as a performing art in which each reader creates their own possible unique related, uh, text-related performance." End quote. With this premise in mind, I suggested a few questions in the survey for the readers to consider as they read the novel, stressing, however, that no answer was right or wrong, and they had the freedom to simply ignore the questions and just share their real existence or experience to the work in order to complete its meaning through the interpretation. To be honest, I did not receive as many surveys back as I was expecting. However, the few that I received I, are quite rich and interesting that I believe they re, uh, represent the diverse and yet uniform Cabo Verdean and Cabo Verdean American readership in expressing their Cabo Verdeanity or Cabo, Verde, Cabo Verdeanness. In the interest of time, short time I have left, uh, what follows is just a sample of the reactions from our readers. One of the survey questions uh, uh, was, did the book teach you anything you didn't know about the lives of some of your relatives? One of the respondents states, this was probably my favorite part of reading the book, that I really felt I could better understand the upbringing of my great-grandfather and the values he passed on to my grandmother and all her siblings. I got a sense of his poverty and struggle to leave it behind. I came to understand the importance of New Bedford in his life and the life of immigrants from Cabo Verde. New Bedford was like a mythical destination almost. His travel to the US on a packet ship and connection with other Cabo Verdeans once he was here, which led him to go wailing on the wanderer." End quote. Here is part of another respondent testimony. Quote, first, some background information about myself that absolutely contributed to my impressions and understanding of the story of Chiquinho. I am a second generation Cape Verdean American. 
all four of my grandparents immigrated to New Bedford in the early 1900s. They were in their, in their 20s when they arrived. My mother's parents both from the same town in Boa Vista. My, my father's parents were the same, were from San Nicolau. My mother's family settled in the south end of New Bedford, in the heart of the Cape Verdean community. My father's family settled in the west end amongst Cape Verdeans, but also other ethnic groups. As I think about my growing up, most of my understanding of Cape Verdean heritage, music, and culture came from my mother's parents. They cooked the traditional foods, cachupa, canja, cald peixe, brignola, couscous. They played Cape Verdean music in the house, went to dances, and spoke the language most of the time, unless talking with us. And, I, and my, I and my siblings, as children, did not learn the language, but recognized certain common phrases and terms. I also saw firsthand what were important characteristics of a Cape Verdean home. Openness, friends, conversations, food, laughter, and share one of oneself your philosophy, beliefs, and stories." End quote. Another question in the survey was, what did you most enjoy about reading this English translation of Chiquinho? To which one Cabo Verdean reader said, I quote, I enjoyed the cultural honesty with which the translation was made. There was a deliberate attempt to maintain the cultural honesty of the text. Names, places, and specific descriptions were not translated. The voice of the author remains alive and the cultural picture is vivid. I recognize the book that I first read many years ago in its original presentation." End quote. The same reader proceeded in answering the following question. Is there anything that frustrated you in reading the, in this English translation of Chiquinho? She stated, I was apprehensive when I first began reading it, fearful of the possibility of seeing violations of a masterpiece and enter it into the endeavor with a degree of skepticism. However, I quickly recognized the characters and the setting. And within a few pages, I forgot that I was reading Chiquinho in English. For me, this was the test of the mastery of the translation. Balthazar was still alive in the pages, and I found myself not struggling to see the picture that Balthazar presented in the Portuguese version. As a Caiverdian, it was important to weave the same setting and to hear the conversations in the same way I heard it and felt the climate in the original version." End quote. And lastly, the testimony of another reader who attended two of the public presentations of Chiquinho. Quote, I was drawn to read Chiquinho immediately as soon as it was translated into English. I have always wanted to read it because of the, its importance and relevance to Cabo Verdean citizens. The author, Baltazar Lopes da Silva, was my maternal grandmother's first cousin, and that motivated me into reading the novel. I had also been taught by mother uh, of Balthazar's position and reputation in Cabo Verde. And I am proud, and I'm proud to be related to such an accomplished man. I was captured by the story of Chiquinho, whose life was similar to many Cape Verdeans of that era who struggled to sought a better life. That was a story I heard many times by my parents and grandparents. 
it was interesting that unlike many citizens of Cabo Verde, Chiquinho was an activist of sorts, given the political climate of the time. He was a normal Cape Verdean boy who became educated and developed courage to be outspoken during troubling times. To me, he was not your average citizen who wanted a better but yet simple life. He had he held on to traditions of family values, but wanted so much more. He was truly a risk taker who was determined to realize his dreams." End quote. So far, we have reached directly over 200 people with these events. And by all accounts from Tagus Press Executive Director Mario Pereira, Chiquinho, a novel of Cabo Verde, is their best seller, with more than 500 copies sold to date. Uh, during the spring semester uh, 2020, we have plans to present the book at Bridgewater State University and to the Cabo Verdean communities in Pataket, Rhode Island, uh, Waterbury and Bridgeport, Connecticut. We plan also to travel to Holland and Luxembourg in June 2020 to bring the book to the Cabo Verdean communities in those countries and then travel to Cabo Verde to present the book in some of the islands. To finish my presentation, I would like to quote the narrator. On South 2nd Street, on a Kushnet Avenue, and on Water Street, he found Cabo Verde reproduced on a small scale in the American landscape. The pestle for pounding the corn for cachupa, the bench for the gain of uril, the songs hummed to the accompaniment of viola and guitar, just like in the islands." End quote. This passage summarizes, to some degree, the resiliency of the Cabo Verdean people to carry and maintaining its identity, culture, and tradition to whatever places they move to, and in this particular case, New England. For our English readers, we hope that you consider acquiring a copy of the book through Amazon or through UMass Press. I have some flyers here with 30% discount, so you can acquire a copy of the book. Um, read, enjoy the reading as much as we enjoy translating Chiquinho. We also hope that the novel will be chosen as one book here at Bristol uh, to give the college community an open door into the Cabo Verdean and Cabo Verdean American history and culture through literature. And if, if you'll inspire when you buy the book and you read and you see the places, uh, in the hallway I have um, an exhibit of pictures that I took mostly uh, in 2015. Um, that we have done several trips to Cape Verde and I, I photograph the places that are portrayed in the novel and some quotes from the novel outside when you leave if you want to take a look at them. And if you are inspired, you can travel to Cape Verde and know those places yourselves. We are humbled and honored to have been part of this mission and journey. Thank you so very much for your attention. <laughs>